Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. We've got a fella on to, that we've had on before in the past, and we're going to go a little bit deeper with him this time. We just interviewed his cousin a little while ago, and uh, now we're going to give him his time in the spotlight, Mr. Michael Bob. Michael, how are you doing? Doing good. How's Alabama treating y'all? Uh, hey, look, it's been a little bit brutally hot <laughs> here lately, I'm not going to lie. But, you know, today didn't feel that bad. It didn't feel that bad, you know, compared to how it has been in the past. So, you know. Could be worse. Looking yeah, forward to fall. Yeah, that, that uh, those uh, Canadian fires that smokes down here, so it's kind of hazing out the sun oh, yeah. a little bit. And oh yeah, you know, gave us a nice break. Yeah, it get, yeah, yeah. It, it's something interesting. Appreciate that, but, uh, Michael. So you were on uh, episode four eighty with your cousin uh, Sonny uh, McCumpsey, and we just interviewed Sonny uh, not very long ago. Um, uh, for his own individual episode. It was a really good episode. We're super excited to have him on talking about slip hunting. And it was fun having you guys both on back in, on episode 480, kind of going back and forth between y'all's different styles and kind of growing up hunting together and everything and kind of how y'all started hunting down South Arkansas. And then y'all kind of, you know, split up and you kind of headed more to the East and he headed more to the West side of the state, but also how y'all kind of still work together and, you know, kind of rotate back and forth between different areas is, is really interesting. And we had some really good feedback from that episode, actually really, really good feedback. So we yep. knew we had to do another episode with you. And actually before the episode even ended, I was like, man, we got to get y'all back on for your individual yeah, episodes. Yeah. So to kick us off, I just want to kind of get right into the meat and potatoes. If people had listened to episode 480, which, guys, if you're listening to this episode and you haven't listened to episode 480, I'd go back and listen to it. because yeah, you got to go back more, and hit it. Yeah, you'll, you'll get some more context of what we're doing here. But you had mentioned a lot about, you know, kind of these overlooked spots. You're, you know, you're hunting eastern Arkansas. Real quick, when we kind of dive into overlooked spots and kind of what this looks like in your area, talk to us a little bit about the habitat and the kind of area of the state you hunt in and how maybe it differs compared to like what Sonny has been hunting kind of in that more western part of the state. Well, so as I said in the other episode, we have a lot of swamps. And, and of course, you know, anytime you have water, you're going to have an open in the canopy, which makes it super thick, usually around those buck brush anywhere from cattail to bug brush to you name it, we got that, veg, you know, and you, you guys probably do too in Alabama, but it really, really draws in the sunlight, which makes it extra, extra thick, hard to get to, hard to access. And so th those areas are some of the areas I try to key into. We'll, we'll jump over to Andrew's question. He's going to ask me a question later about the difficulty of getting to some of these spots. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, going back to the other episode, keeping in mind, I, I can tell you, and I'm thinking about a couple of areas in particular, public areas like we talked about, uh, some of them not too far from the road, but one in my, uh, that I have in mind that, that I actually I kind of have to work on continuously. It's a really, really good area. It's not far to get to, but I have to kind of go in there and chop my way in and make, I kind of make me my own access to it. Uh, number one, to, to, to be stealthy and quiet. Number two, not to drag drag my scent on every limb that I have to bend over and you know crawl through and all that. But these areas, I have I have discovered that some of these areas, and if you think if you think of this as a, as a year round thing, and, and it kind of makes me think of the fishing. You know, I've been catching crappie in open water. And I've come to realize they them fish live there all the, all year long, and the, and the whitetail buck is the same way. He he he'll a lot of times pick a spot by a swamp because he's got open open it's open canopy a little bit, and it gets that browse down there where he can literally lay down and stay laid down and and nibble around, and they'll do that and they'll move beds and they'll nibble around, but they'll stay a lot of times around that swamp. Well, he knows that swamp by, by like the back of his hand. So, you you know, you kind of got to give him a little element of surprise and maybe come in from a way that he's not expecting you to. But that, to me, that's one of the most overlooked places. There's there's a few places that I really that I really like to hunt. Um, a couple of them are boat access. And believe it or not, man, people, people will put their boats in. And they'll go a mile or two down the bio and some of those places are right on the bank of, you know, right there. And they're just little corners that are overlooked that has, of course, for, for a buck to spend several days in an area has to have some cover. That's one of the key element that if you, if you're going to go in there and, and 
if you go in there and find him and he and you know he's gonna a, a place where it's being overlooked by human activity it's still got to have cover but if you can find all them things fig, figure you out a way to get in there to it and what what i've done on one of these properties that one of these public properties that i hunt is i literally so this swamp you can see from the road right so i, I went down from the swamp and, and literally hacked my way in right down down the edge into an opening and it was just a little pin open flat opening that went around behind it but you couldn't really get to it so i hacked me a way in there and made it really really i, I mean i could slip in there so quiet and, and even in another area i even went as far as raking the leaves back before season you know of course you're going to do all kind of noise and scent and everything else so you want to do that whenever you don't you know you think he's not not there or right before a rain a lot of times i'll do it right before a rain so it'll what you know helps wash my scent away better but uh, sometimes i make my own access to these overlook spots and most of the time it is a core area that a buck will live all year long and it's got everything he needs you know and and if it's got some some mass you know some acorns or anything like that he's gonna have no traffic right there when when that time comes a lot of these older deer you know we talked about deer dying of old age a lot of these older deer that's their game they they live in a little hole in the wall and whenever they go breed you know that they're going to get out in daylight hours and stay kind of close to that and they're they're going to roam at night and they'll go maybe a mile but they're going to head back back and 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 get right get right back against that swamp before we ever get back out there and that's kind of what i've it's kind of what i've learned to kind of key in on now i may not hunt that every single time that type of set set up every single time but i do like to have four or five of those areas that i can go to especially early season because you know that's his summer home michael there's so much in what you just said that we're going to end up getting into that i'm real interested in but to kind of lay the groundwork a little bit more again if if uh, the listeners if y'all haven't heard episode 480 definitely go back and listen to that but i want i want to lay some groundwork here so you're hunting more swamp land a lot of water uh thickets stuff like that and also on a lot of the places you hunt you were saying that you can't use any trail cameras so you're kind of going back to old school sign reading and and you're very dependent on how well you can read sign and what kind of sign is on the ground uh to kind of kick us off, I want to I want to go through the whole process of how you end up finding success. So, what is it that you're looking for in an area where you know? And then these swamps, I guess, if you look at a map, it can be kind of overwhelming. Like it seems like it's just you know a big swamp. There's just like a bunch of mature timber all over the place, a lot of water. So, what are you looking at to narrow down to say, okay, there's going to be a buck that lives in this general area? Like, you know, it's not going to be void of deer or anything like that. Yeah. So it kind of so it kind of goes back to and now don't get me wrong, I do a ton of e scouting, especially if it's a place that I haven't walked into yet. I'll get on my computer or on my Onyx on my phone. You know, I, I prefer Onyx. Some people use not saying other ones, but I'll get on my Onyx and and literally see, you know, you can zoom it up and you can see what kind of trees are there and, and I just kind of figure all that in. But it seems it seems to me that if you know what really keys me in is is food, water. Water is a big deal, and a lot of people when when season comes, uh, they they over you know they it kind of goes in the back of your mind. You know you you kind of forget about the water part of it, and uh, but all that plays in, especially on an early season hunt. It kind of all plays in to to what I look for. And, and it, it's always great to have a funnel. If you if you can find his travel corridor to go in and out of there, if you can find, you know, if, if you find you a, a place and you go in there and, and getting back to the sign, if you go in there and you see, be, you know, big, you know, we all, you know, you all see those four foot long, five foot long deer beds and you just, you know, not having cameras, you have to use your imagination and you got to say, man, it's got to be a buck, you know, and, and, so, you know, finding those deer beds uh, and, and tracks going through these little travel corridors going in and out, if he's got to go through a little pinch point, uh, that is that, you know, but I look for food um, and 
places that are overlooked by humans, you know, we, we tend to go, you know, I want to, I want to put the most work in and go walk the furthest. That was always my game plan is work. And I would work so hard all year long and walking everywhere and walking the furthest distance. And, you know, there's been several times and I know it's happened to you guys. I've walked a mile and a half and look up and there, <laughs> there's the other mile and a half right there beside me. So, so, so I, I really, the last four or five years, I've really keyed in on these overlooked corners sometimes. So one of the situations where I found a really big buck was, was actually where a bio had a corner. It made a little corner, kind of a dog leg, and it was really thick, had a lot of blowdowns. I want to talk about blowdowns in a minute because blowdowns, you know, just a, a big, huge oak tree blown down or, or any kind of tree, uh, that's a, I got a little trick to tell you about on them, but anytime there's brush tops, blowdowns, a little honeysuckle thickets, I mean, guys, I mean, there's a ton of times, and I know it's happened to you guys, have cover two foot tall on the, on the, on the, in the, in the forest floor, and that's what he'll bed in. Uh, sometimes it's a different kind of grass that's by this, that's by this area, this swamp. We got, I don't know what kind of grass it is. Not a what you call a herb, herbatologist, whatever, but I don't know what this grass is, but there are certain grass up here that grows in some of these areas and they love to lay on it. And I think they even eat it, but they love to lay on this grass. So any kind of cover is what I really look for. You know, just to, just the cliche things, food cover and no human disturbance is the biggest thing I found. All right. Again, so much there that I want to unpack. I want to talk about the thickets, I want to talk about the food. But one thing in particular that you said, food cover water, in what way are you using water in these swamps? Like, are you using water as a barrier or a funnel or did it, or as a barrier or a funnel to people, you know, like keeping people out of the it's, spot? Yes and yes. So, so I'm going to use the water to my advantage if I can find an easy way around it. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of instances that I can think of in the, in the recent past where I would put waders on um, and go straight in right across them. A lot of people ain't going to do that in September. I'll turn early October because we still got cotton out. So anyway, we got we still got snakes really bad. A lot of people's not going to wade through snaky, swampy stuff to go to go. You know, especially just for scouting. You know, so uh, but so the water the water plays. I mean, it, it plays a lot into into I actually use it. It's kind of a double-edged sword. So the deer's got to have water. You know, we all know that he he wants to stay close to water, but it's for various reasons. There's there's vegetation in that water that they're eating, also. But they're going to use that water. They're going to use that water to their advantage for hearing some you know predators come to them. Us walking in the water, they're going to use that for protection. But they're also going to you know they're going to use that you know for the fresh lush vegetation. But I like to use it, you know, sometimes I'll get right in the edge of the water and come around. But most of the time, the vegetation's too much. It's certain, certain these uh, sloughs and stuff that we have, they got a lot of buck brush in them, and you can't slip around the edge. So sometimes you got to go up, take the long way around. But I think the deer use the water to their advantage. I think that's why a lot of times they're, they're, they're using this. They're, they're behind these, these water holes, and, and even – I know you heard uh, talk about the deer laying up on a root wad in the water. A lot of times they'll get out in it. Uh, w- one other thing, this is something that I've learned. So uh, Southeast Arkansas has a period of time where it floods and everything down there is underwater. And those deer are used to that. It's, it's nothing to them. They, they, they'll walk around in chest deep water all day long and they'll, They'll lay on a root wad until it gets feeding time or whatever. One thing that I have noticed that they will use does. Now I don't, I don't know exactly what what's going on with this, and if it, tell me if this happens where you are. But when that doe is in full blown estrus, and that buck, when it's to the point where she's being chased, she will. If there is water anywhere nearby, she's going to hit that water every single time. No matter, she'll go out of her way. She'll go hit that water. Uh, that's kind of getting off track of as far as scouting goes. But man, when it's rut time, I'm going to be by water. If there's water there, I'm going to be sitting right by. It. 
just for that reason. I've seen it so many times. Okay, interesting. Now, moving on to kind of the next thing, thickets or cover, bedding cover. You you mentioned a little bit about blowdowns and about areas that have kind of sparse canopy cover, which is going to allow sunlight to get to the forest floor, which is going to let stuff grow up that's, yeah. that's going to create bedding cover. What what are y'all's what is bedding cover to you specifically? Like for us, it's like a, a two hundred acre clear cut that's grown up for three or four yeah. years and it's just unbelievably thick. Is it the same scale where you're at or are you dealing with like little half acre thickets where three or four trees have fallen over? Well, so keep in mind now I, what I'm going what I'm talking to you about, what I'm referring about is big timber growth. Yeah, it's big timber growth. We don't have a lot of, you know, it, our, our Arkansas Game and Fish owns a ton of public land, but most of it, they don't cut it. So what you run into a lot of times is big brush tops and big blowdowns. And what I've noticed, and like, like we were saying, the edges of these sloughs, so that's where that little bit of sunlight comes in, and you'll get this little bit of green growth that'll come that'll come up here sometimes it's honeysuckle sometimes it's just little bushes and they'll lay down right there in it as long as they as long as they feel like they're safe so sometimes it's really really subtle but one thing one thing that that we do have and, and it is a big time bedding you know it's it's basically that buck will get in there and hide but it's those blowdowns they love to get in them blowdowns but for for here, here's an example so we we have some woods that you can see 150, 200 yards in, and it's just open everywhere. If you get to really looking, sometimes you'll see. I don't know what these things are, but it'll be a. It'll sometimes it's little green briars, and sometimes it's a little sawbriar patch that that may only be this tall. And that deer will he, that'll be that'll hit his bed in there. I mean, he'll he'll literally use that as cover, and he's in a wide open heavy, you know, hundred year growth timber trap. And and they'll get in they'll get in that and they'll lay down. And once he lays down, he, he just disappears almost. And and those as well, they'll get right there. And so for example, I was walking last year, I was walking through some open woods along a little along a little bit of a ridge, kind of a kind of a sand what I call a sand ridge, just about three or four foot taller than the rest. And kind of walking and still hunting scouting really is what i was doing just looking and that's what i do a ton of during the season and so i'm slipping down through there and there's a there's a there's a dead tree right a tree that had died and it left a big hole in the canopy you've heard of people going duck hunting in the scatters or duck hunting in the, in the timber and finding a hole in the timber well that hole creates under undergrowth and and they'll use that dead tree that died 10 20 years ago and they'll bed right there so this is exactly what happened so this tree died and it was a gigantic tree. There was the stump was still there and everything, but it had created a 40 yards wide circle of really thick sawbriars and greenbriars just mixed, just nasty. And I walked up there and I got really, really close to it. And about that time, nine deer jumped out of that one little bit of water stuff. And I mean, we're talking about wide open woods. I watched them run for 150 yards. But I got right on top of them because they were hit. And that's the that's the type of stuff that our deer in, the, in these big timber, in these big timber situations. That's what that's what they bed in, and it's either that or they'll travel to a big thicket. Now there are some private holdings that'll have real thick, bad thickets you can't walk through, and and but these older deer they seem to they don't want to travel across these openings like that too much. They'll find these little subtle places and, and hole up in them. And uh, and that's, I mean, that's sometimes our bedding areas. And I've even went out of state hunting in places that there, there isn't even that much. And they'll just lay down in the middle of the woods, just in a place where they hadn't been bothered, you know, a place that hadn't had any human traffic. Mm-hmm. That that's interesting and that's fascinating too, having deer laid up in something so small and such open timber. Cause I always like to think about like, man, how long were they just watching you walk through the woods and they're like, Is he yeah. coming all the way over here? Is he coming? And then you get yeah. a little too close and they're like, All right, yeah, we're out. Yeah. You know? Yeah, what gets me is 
how many times have you walked right by them and they never even got up? Mm. That's that's what gets me. I mean, if I would have been fifty yards to the side or or over that little hump, you know, walking down through there, they'd have never even got up. I never would have known they were there until until they see me go by, you know, and and they'll slip a lot of times, run out the backside. But, uh, but yeah, they they sometimes I, these deer, and that's that's what, and it makes them hard to hunt. I mean, because you may have these things scattered all over this big four or five hundred acres of of over, you know hundred year old timber. And they just stop and pick a spot sometimes. But if you can find a pattern of where that stuff's at, you know, and, and you know, going back to no trail cameras, some of our public land, I won't really put a trail camera out because it gets quite a bit of, you know, other hunters at uh, traffic. So I'll just go by sign. And, and that's what you want to look for is tracks. You know, any, any of the little twisty rubs around something like that, that's, that tells you he's going to lay back down there again, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not letting Jacob talk on this podcast. Uh, when you when you're out scouting and you find some of those bedding thickets and and you start running across them, what do you then do with that information? I mean, are you are you marking that on your map and you're saying this is a bedding area and then you know basing yep, something else off that? Okay, I drop a pin. Yeah, yeah. I'll show you my. I'll show you my. You have Onyx. Oh yeah. I'll show you my Onyx uh, map, and it's it's. I don't know. I, my my biggest issue with that is I I'll drop a pin and I won't edit it, and then I just know that's a spot. That's you know. What I mean, I, I have so many of them that I I tend to forget what each one of them are. Yeah, I can stand for, so. Yeah, yeah, we got a lot. Anyway, of them. so now and this is like a little. We could go a lot deeper on this, but I'm just I'm curious when you find one of those really good little bedding spots. And the reason I'm so curious on this is because we have a couple hunts this year in very similar terrain that I'm very, very excited to, to try this, this kind of tactic. This is the year of the river bottom. So yeah, for, there's three, there's three yeah, hunts, three hunts. So, but anyways, good deal. when you, when you go find something like that, uh, are you then like basing hunts off that? Like, okay, today I'm going to go and I'm going to hunt right here around this particular bedding thicket and, and you're fine. Each of those is like a potential hunt. D- it depends on, see, I will definitely want, if I find the sign, what, what by sign, I mean, if I find, you know, a lot of times there's, there's one in particular place that I'm going to drive to and it's a couple hour drive for me. So I'm going to go down there and stay f- a few days at a time. So if I go down there and I go, slip into my place where I, and, and kind of just check it, make sure there's not someone hadn't been in there messing around and, and put a stand up or whatever. I'm going to go in there, and if I find the sign in those subtle beds like we're talking about and and in, and in these little travel corridors that go from a little, you know, around a corner of a swamp or whatever, um, if I find the fresh sign and tracks, man, people – so I emphasize a ton on tracks. They're fresh tracks. I mean – Especially the you know now the especially early season early season we're gonna get lots of rains and leaves are gonna cover it up so if if I've got a lot of tracks early season I'll go set I'll go set that out for sure now you know looking back hindsight you know you, we, you may set a spot a lot of times what I'll do is I'll sit in a spot and come 11, 12 o'clock I'll get down and I might not walk back to my truck I may go you know I'm sure y'all have done that too and, and go look and, and then little did I know there's a bet you know I should have been 400 yards down you know you know I mean I do that a lot so you ain't going to necessarily nail it every time but I definitely go back and, and plan to hunt these spots that I find like that. Mm-hmm. all right I'll, I'll let you talk what, what you got Jacob <laughs> there's there's so much here uh one thing I want not to I, I want to stay on this topic but I know on the uh, episode 480 that we had you on, you talked about this buck that you got on at one time that was roughly, you said, 180 inches. What was the habitat mm-hmm. that deer was living in, and what was the situation of, like, how did you learn about the deer, and what was the encounter like? So, all right, so I, I'll, I'll paint this whole picture for you real quick. So it was me and a buddy, okay, and we, 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 we come down the bio, and the bio made – kind of made a bend and, and come around and went straight south. And I went around and dropped him out, okay? And the, and the wind was blowing out of the southeast. 
Okay. So I put him on, on a ridge that was coming down the side of the bow for him to, to catch that traffic because there was a lot of honeysuckle down this ridge. So I put him down there. We were probably four, probably 600 yards apart. Okay. So I went back around and there was a little ditch that came in that put me, that put me, you know, completely on the other side. Now I'm hunting, I'm hunting in wide open woods. No, now there's, there's tons of blowdowns, right? And there's water to my, to my straight south and water between me and him. So, and it was an afternoon hunt. I've been there about an hour and I look up straight towards the southeast where he's at. And I see deer running towards me. Okay. And one of these deer was this 180 inch perfect 12 point. It was a perfect 10, but he had kickers, kickers out here about four inches long on the, right up on the top of his G2. It was just a cool looking deer. Needless to say, he so he was chasing a huge doe. Needless to say, he came right by me, and I had a limb in the way, so I didn't I didn't shoot. I thought I'd get another shot. Of course, they took off running. So, what I learned was that deer was the, in that corner in that sharp bend of that bow. When we went around there, and, and I got out with my buddy to show him where to sit. He smelled us because the wind was blowing in his bedding area. Well, I jumped back in the boat and went around to where I was at. So we stirred them up. All right. Long story short, I didn't kill the deer, but I kind of had an idea where he was coming from. So the very next day I go back and I, and the winds changed, right? The winds now coming out of the North. So I go around and I get in the water and I slip up there with about, within about 150 yards where I thought, you know, water comes up and then it's dry ground and it's literally a 30, 40 acre corner right in here several blowdowns so i know he was in those blowdowns right? so i slip up there and i get on this faint ridge that come out here to me and it was nine o'clock in the morning i'm planning on hunting all day long but i wanted to get in there when he when he was just got settled you know and he was trying to get as close as i could to him so i'm sitting there and i you know and i'm hours just went by 2 30 in the afternoon a boat comes down the ditch down the bow, my, I'm giving away my, I can't say too many details. It comes down the waterway. How about that? <laughs> and stops right on the bank of where, right between me and the deer. Now, I don't know for sure the deer's there. Right? And about the time he stops, I hear a squirrel dogs barking. And I hear a beating and banging, and I hear a 22 go off a couple of times. This is about 400 yards from me. And my, the, I was I was dead on the money on, on on knowing right where he was at. Had the wind in my favor, had had the sign and the perfect. I could even see where the deer, all that herd of deer, had went in there that 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 night before that. And when those guys come up with that squirrel dog, they busted them up and they ran and missed me by about a hundred yards. And he was it was him, another buck, and four or five does. But just just a corner like that, and so nobody had been stopping there for probably a month or so when this guy came and squirrel hunted that spot and running, you know, run him out. But just, a, it was just a corner. It was just a little corner, tons of blowdowns, four or five blowdowns. I could probably, I probably could have walked right to one of them that he was laying in, you know, but he was, he was so beautiful and so big. I didn't want to get any closer than what I got. And so I don't regret any, I don't even regret not, not getting the deer, but, uh, and then, after that, things changed. Duck season opened, and everything was everything was totally different after that. He, never seen him again. And that's kind of the story here in Arkansas. You'll see a deer, a, a target buck, and you may never see him. You get one chance, and you don't get him. It's, it's usually over. So I want to talk more about the blowdowns. <clears throat> the blowdowns is interesting. We've had recently quite a few listeners reach out to us wanting more flat land or river bottom like conversations like this. Uh, which is kind of funny because sometimes I feel like it's the opposite. But uh, recently we've had a lot of interest in this uh, from guys across the southeast that are just interested in learning more about these areas. And in these areas, again, when there's no logging, the only way you're getting any kind of cover happening is, like you're saying, with the blowdowns. Dead trees dying, opens up the canopy. Yeah, you have the brush tops on the ground that they may bed in, but you have all that thick, you know, like the honeysuckle or the green briar and everything growing around it. 
Can you give us like an idea, like you know, and these these are big trees too. We're not talking about small timber in this area. You're talking about really big trees. Right. Probably a lot of them too big to even get a climber in. Um, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. And when you're talking about like these these blowdowns and how thick they are, you kind of mentioned earlier like the the real big one that you had seen uh, on the scouting trip going in that was you know 40 yards wide of this you know green briar, just real thick stuff. But typically. How thick are some of these areas? I mean, are they all like that? Or sometimes will they just bed in just a top where there's maybe no, you know, green briar, there's no honeysuckle around it, but they just kind of lay up in those branches and everything? I, I think that happens a lot uh, wh where I go. I think they actually get in those. They literally get, crawl up in those tops. Um, I was not trying to refer you back to my YouTube video, one of my YouTube videos, but – I done a scouting video and I was literally videoing myself finding sign and it led me up into a top tons of huge buck tracks again no cameras um, and I and I, I later put cameras out there and I got pictures of bucks but these buck tracks go right up in this top I mean it was a big huge fork and just a place where they just go up in there and, and lay down I mean I do I do they do that a lot uh, sometimes if it's wet, there'll be some branches they'll they'll get up there and lay on. And I know that sounds crazy to some people. If you don't hunt around water, you don't. It's really hard to comprehend. These deer will lay. They'll lay up on the log. Literally, they'll lay up on the log to, to stay dry. Especially when you when you're getting uh, below thirty degrees or so, they're going to get out. Of, they got to get out of that water, and they got. If there's lots of water everywhere, they're going to lay, lay on a log, anything. But they love root wads. But I want to say we're talking, you know, you, you're, you know, you want to, you got a lot of people asking about blowdowns. And I want to tell you, and I <clears throat> shut me down if I get to talking to you, but check this out. So I had an old timer one time tell me, he said, if you find a blowdown, a really big blowdown, he said, use that as a funnel. And I've talked about that in some of my content. Use that as a funnel. A lot of times there'll be some straight line winds and it'll knock two or three trees down in a row. All right. And I'll use that as a funnel, but check this out. This old timer told me this one time and I, and I, and I found it to be true. He said, anytime you find a blowdown in the big timber, he said, that's your pinch point. He said, but get on the, on the opposite end as the root one. He said, he'll come around that end every single time. And I have tried that. And the big, the big 180. When, he, when I seen them running to me, you know, they were spooked from my buddy, I guess, or his scent. And they ran over there, and they and they were on the other side of a blowdown, and they stopped. And that big buck, actually, the tree wasn't all the way on the ground. He went underneath that tree and popped out and went back up underneath it and went around the end of it, right around the limbs. Now, why that is, I don't know, but... Maybe he's a little spooky. Show those of the root one. I don't know, but they'll go around that that bushy end of that blowdown every time. And he did. He did exactly that. He went back like he was leaving, and he circled around and come within thirty yards of me, right around, right around. And I got actually got that on video, and I don't know where the video is, but I've actually got that on video, and it's pretty cool to watch him. He goes back under the blowdown. It goes right around the end of it. You get that one video? Limb. Yes, I do. Ooh, Ooh. I, I yeah, guess. I'll have to find it, but I do have it on video. I video with my phone. Is it, on the, is, is it on the YouTube channel? No, it's not. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, you, uh, you, yeah. Got, you got to send it over. Forget, forget <laughs> everybody else. You, I want to see it. Dude. Yeah, you got to be privileged to be able to see this one. He's big because if I showed him to someone, very many people, they would figure out where I seen him at. And, and of course, it, this has been a few years ago. He might be snapped out of there by now. I don't know. But he was beautiful. He was a big big deer so it's funny how you talk about the blowdowns the straight line winds and how the deer are funnel around it so me and andrew just scouted a place not too long ago uh river bottom piece of public and we found exactly what you're talking about where at first i thought it was tornado damage but it wasn't tornado it was straight line winds because it wasn't like a huge area it was like strips of trees that got blown down in the dude i'm telling you all in the same direction you, you, you talk about the, the the best damn funnel I've, some of the best funnels i've ever seen we're like oh yeah you'd have you know, three different rows of tr big, you know, groups of trees go straight down for a hundred yards. There'd be a twenty-yard gap in between them, 
And then it would yep. tee off into an opening where you have another group of trees that went, you know, parallel <laughs> to it. And it's like the deer can't go through it. There's no way. There's, I mean, I, there's no way. Like you physically, you're not crawling under yeah. and you're not going over the top because these are giant. Yeah, they got to go around the end. Yeah. Go, go around yeah. the end. And I told Andrew one of those spots. It's not far from where we actually found a guy's uh, ladder stand that he had ditched down by the water. Um, that he's probably just walking in, probably fifty yards and hanging it up. Uh, right. but clearly it was from last year. It's been sitting there all season long and these trees had just blown down cause they were, the tops were still green on when we got in there. And yeah. what I was telling Andrew, I'm like, dude, this looks like such a good bow spot, not even a gun spot. Cause we can gun hunt this place, but it's be such a good bow spot. Yeah. And you could put a mock scrape in right where all these intersections where all these blown trees, da- all these blown trees kind of like end up in this, like it makes like a hub where you have four or five different entry points into this area that are all 20 to 40 yards wide oh, yeah. into the center hub. It's like a spoke of a wheel, like how they blown down. And you could put a mock scrape there. It'd be an awesome place to put a trail oh, camera. Yeah. And I was telling Andrew, we weren't finding a lot of deer sun while we were there. But I think the reason why is like past like rubs and scrapes and stuff. Part of it's because it floods out. So a lot of that stuff gets washed away, at least the scrapes and stuff, even though you can see looking branches and all that. But in addition to that, more than likely, last year it was big, wide open timber, and there was no thickets there. But now, with all the blow down tops and everything, oh yeah, I, I'm like, dude, it ought to be oh. unbelievable. It's this gonna year. become an unbelievable. And thicket. I told, I told him for the yeah. rut, I'm like, this would be the intersection of everything we scouted that oh, yeah. I would go in blind. I'm not even too worried about wind direction because you don't know which path the deer are gonna be coming down. Right. And right. sit that sucker for a couple of days, and literally all day sits, yeah. and you probably have an opportunity. Yeah. And that and that leads me to another thing, and I don't I don't want to jump the gun, but um, I tell you a lot a lot. So an, another piece of property that I hunt that we actually can that we can actually fire on hunt, but it's shotgun or muzzleloader. A lot of times, what I'll do on that property is I will ground hunt, and it's not so much steel hunting or stalk hunting like Sonny's talking about, but I'll I'll actually build me a blind a natural totally natural blind i don't like pop-up blinds because i i can't hear good and i can't see everything i want to see but i'll build me a makeshift blind in a blowdown and they'll sometimes will walk right by you i mean just if, if you got the wind right like you said in that one particular setup you know you don't really know where they're coming from uh you'd have to do a little study a little more study and then you don't know what you're not always going to know where they're you know, you can't read the deer every time. But most time, you know, you get the wind right. You can you can set up on the ground in a spot like that. I, I can see that working pretty well oh, yeah. in that spot. Yeah. And if you're gonna put if you're gonna put like a build a natural blind in a lo, in a location like that, would you build the blind on the 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 treetop side, like the branch side, or would you do it on the more the stump or log side? So what I would you know think thinking about. The deer going around the, the brushy side. What, what I would do and what I normally do is I'll get, if it's a big tree, I'll get, you know, that tree is going to be nothing but a big trunk until it gets up there and starts splitting. And I want to get right where those splits are every time. And I'll I'll chop me a couple of little bitty tiny holes if I need to in the limbs. If I'm bow hunting and, and you know, or even, even muzzleloader or shotgun, and I'll still cut me a couple of spots. Not much. You don't want to cut too much. And sometimes I'll add stuff, you know, it just depends. There's one top that I got to set up in right now, left over from last year, that it's starting to rot down some. But it's, I mean, it's wide open, and it, you can see so much better from the ground. Some some places, the ground setups up here are better than than getting up and being elevated. So that's my that's my spot for that. So I'm gonna have to go back and probably add a little bit of cover to that top. I'll probably do that as as soon as I can get access to get. Now, also in these bottoms, you know, if you know how bucks are traveling through these bottoms, um, like what you're saying, do you see them using, you know, if it's fairly flat, but you know, every now and then you have these subtle, you know, two foot little dips or like little rises and stuff. Like a ridge might be three, four feet tall, like what you're talking about, maybe. Um, and we found a spot like that where right off the water, probably 40, 50 yards off the water. Yep. There's a little ridge, a little rise. I'm talking four or five feet of elevation at the most, at the very mm-hmm. most. And it was funny, all the buck sign was down by the water, thick, you know, by a thicker brush. And then, you know, as you got off the water, it got, you know, more and more open. And it seemed like, 
again, all the buck sign was down by the water in that little low spot, and they could travel down by the water next to that, you know, thicker stuff on the edge of the water. But because of that little ridge, you know, a buck's not standing very tall, um, and he would be so hidden. Like, you could be hunting even in a tree on the other side of that little ridge, and if you're 75, 80 yards from him, you might not see that deer, probably won't see that deer if he's down in that That's little right. low spot. And where I'm trying to get at is, do you see bucks using those little low spots to kind of travel in between brush tops or kind of getting through those bottoms if you have a little ditch or something running through there? Yeah, and you know, you hear people, I do actually, and that brings, reminds me of something. So you hear people say, you know, that buck's going to travel that ridge, you know, and and, and he's going he's gonna, to, you know, be on a ridge where he can smell better and catch those scent and stuff like that. But I'll tell you, and, and it remind you say that reminded me, what I notice a lot of times we have some little bitty, and I don't really know what. So we have some some woods here that I hunt that are kind of rolling, and but between these little mounds, there'll be a little bitty flat area, almost like a creek, but just just a little low spot. And what I have noticed is a lot of times when the acorns start falling pin oak and, and, and in these little low spots you have a lot of pin oaks and i mentioned you know last time that's what we have fall first is pin oaks and red oaks but what early in the season i think that i think the bucks do that and i think i, I think one of the reasons why is because when when these trees start knocking acorns out they'll fall to that very lowest spot and they just go down through there whatever it is about that clean ground if it's you know if it's like some of these places I'm thinking about are really clean, but, you know floods or rain has washed stuff away, and those acorns are just laying there to be you know. And I think a lot of times they're just walking around through there picking up acorns. They can be quiet because there's not a lot of you know there's not a lot of stuff in these low these little low strips. I'm, I'm not I don't know if it's exactly the the same scenario you're talking about, but I think a lot of times when they go into that little low spot, I think they're could be picking up acorns doing that. Yeah. And, and staying hid and, and staying quiet, sneaking sneaking from one place to another. Now, also, I want to ask you about boat access. So it's kind of funny how you, you were talking about boat access and boat access and water access kind of gets you away from people. I felt in Arkansas, at least where I hunted, there was a decent amount of people using boat access during deer season. Now, this was November. Oh, um, yeah. On this, yeah. this piece of public, you could hunt with a firearm. Um, and you know, there was a decent amount of boats out there, uh, guys hunting, you know, fairly close. So it's like, I never walked into a guy or like anything like that, but you know, my brother, he sat in a spot where he audibly heard a guy cough from his tree stand 60 yards from him. on the other edge is a little thicket that he couldn't see past. And then he heard the guy start rattling antlers. He's like, that is not a deer. Um, and yeah, but when I, when I think of Arkansas, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up, when I think of Arkansas, especially kind of like the areas that you hunt and even the like area that I hunted last year, you know, duck hunting is so popular, okay? It seems like everybody and their mother has a boat. What about boat access? Have you learned anything about boat access and getting creative with boat access gets you away from some of that pressure when there still is a decent amount of guys doing it, but you're still able to kind of get away from some of those guys? Like, what is your thought process on that? Well, so the the best the best I mean there like you said there's a ton of people up here that access these places that are strictly hardcore deer hunters and they're they're going to get out there and they're going to find these places. So I, I'll kind of refer back, you know, and I'll do it just like if I was if I was planning on going a place that you can drive in, I might go to these a little bit. Ones that's just a little bit more hard to get to. I mean, you can. There's places in Arkansas, and I'm sure there is where y'all are. There's some WMAs here that are. You can. You could go. You could work as hard getting to a place with a boat as you could if you had to walk two miles. You know, I mean, you know, running your boat through thickets and and you know through buck brush or through a slough that you don't think you can even get through. I mean, there's there's different strategies to do that. But my number one thing what I do and it cuts out, I don't know, it's a huge percentage, but I just wait on duck season. And the later, so, and that gets me back to another thing about timing. Timing is is really what I I fall back. It take, to get away from the hunting pressure, I'll use timing, maybe go during the week. Uh, but 
when duck season hits, most of these most of these guys are going to at some point they're going to ch- convert over to duck hunting. Uh, and I don't convert over unless I'm out of buck tags. So that that's kind of my strategy. I just wait on duck season. So that that's actually funny you bring that up because that's what I had a couple of locals tell me as well that a lot of these guys will deer hunt until duck season and when duck season comes, especially if they're not having a great deer season, they kind of give up yeah. deer hunting and they start picking up that shotgun and get out there with the shotgun. And yeah, you have a lot of boat pressure, just people drive around and stuff. But it seems like with that kind of pressure and you kind of understand where that duck hunting pressure is going to be at, you can kind of maybe even use that to your advantage. Like, yeah, it could push deer out of certain areas, but also can kind of work for you in different areas as well. What is your thoughts on using duck hunting pressure to work for you? So that's part of the story about that big, about that big buck that I didn't allude to, but this place that I seen him was heavily, heavily trafficked by duck hunters. We're talking 40, 50 boats a day would go right by this deer. But so what it was is he was up in, a, in this corner and this corner was dry. And, you know, the ducks are going to be down. They're going to be like the further you go down this slough, the deeper the woods, the water in the woods was. That's where all the traffic, all the people duck on, you know, they was going on both sides of the slough. But they were hundreds of yards down, set, you know, five, six, seven hundred yards down. And the more traffic, the more week by week goes by, it kind of pushed those deer back up into that corner where everything was dry. And and that's kind of so so looking looking back, and you know, you can use that for for you know, look at look at some other areas, topo on your maps and find these dry spots. Maybe that maybe that people are driving by, but but maybe it's in the very back corner. And 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 go get it. You know that's where the deer's going to be. They're going to be. If there's an what I call an island. If you know there's this one WMA that, that 80, 90 percent floods, but there's high places out in it. Man, they're loaded with deer, especially late in the season. And everybody's converted over to duck hunting. You can go on these dry, on this dry ground. You got to have a boat to get to it, and it's three quarters of a mile boat ride or a mile boat ride, and you can get out there, man. I, there's so many untouched places. Once it gets duck season into mid December, that's when the, that's when it's magic up here. And I and I'll be honest, a lot of times, some, some years I'm tagged out, and uh, but I'm going to try to save. I'm going to try to save my tags, and that's what my focus is going to be this year. Is, is Southeast Arkansas late in late in the year, first around the first of December, going to these places like this these little dry humps and these little dry corners when, when people are no worries about the activity because they're duck hunting, you know, and they're, the deer's kind of done got comfortable in them for a couple of weeks. And I'm going to, I'm going to spend some time with that this year. Hopefully I'll get some good content to show y'all and you'll see it in person. For sure. Well, let me ask you this, that you kind of mentioned something I wanted to ask you about with boat pressure, you know, with a boat, even, a, you know, a four stroke, which, you know, four stroke outboard that could be, you know, fairly quiet, you know, a mud motor, Service drives super loud, no matter how you do it, even with the exhaust on it. Um, but if you're using an outboard, uh, which maybe you do, maybe you use a surface drive. I'm, I'm not sure what you have on your boat specifically, but it's a, yeah, I use outboard. Okay, so how do deer react to, or how do you think deer react to boat noise, like out, you know, motors and you know, big motors earlier in the season versus kind of later in the season like you, you already said they kind of get conditioned with that boat pressure later in the season but how yeah. do they react early in the season like or is it one of those things that like you know if you're say you're not going to hunt very far from the water early season are you trying to get three four hundred yards away from there and, and then like park the boat and then ease into that spot or will you kind of get that boat all the way in there and then walk that 75 to 100 yards until where you want to try to set up so so this particular this um just when you when you talk it makes me think of certain uh, thir- you know certain areas so one particular area that that i have in mind and it's funny that you say that my brother not me and my brother hunt together some and my brother went in and and literally parked on the slough and there's a high spot right on the slough and he literally parked and sat right on top of his boat if that if that kind of answers your question in other words he knew the deer was coming down through there. Duck hunters all parked their boats on the down the side of the slough. So 
they they don't walk by four or five boats if they if they're coming up you know if they're coming up this ridge. So I mean, I I mean it was, and, and the thing is he actually shot a nice buck, and it walked right by his boat. I mean I I think it's it was later in the season. I think it just takes it may take them, you know it may take them, and I'm no expert on this. I'm not a deer, but it, it may take them a week or two to get used to the traffic, and 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 you know. Two or th- maybe two or three encounters, and then realizing, hey, they're they're just you know maybe you know they're not after me or whatever, and they'll get they'll get used to it. I think within a week, and and probably they'll, they'll probably walk right by the right by a boat or whatever. I mean, uh, but he actually he actually got a pretty good buck, and it was it was it walked within 20, 30 steps of his boat. So now, how does that dictate compared to early season though? You know, if it's you know. October or something is is it more of a consideration that 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 noise and, and boat placement of how you're acting? Yeah, I would, I would I would think so. Yeah, 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 I would think so. And but the thing is, in in October, some most of these places hadn't flooded yet, so it's later. So it's usually duck season when when duck season gets here. People are you know one week before duck season, they're scouting, they're driving up now wherever they can get their boats to, they're going. And I think that that kind of acclimates the deer, you know, when that scout and the duck hunting scouting starts, I think, I think within just within days, it's, you know, I think you could, you could just chalk it up and just drive on in there where you want to go. Of course, you know, I want to hunt. Not, I don't want to hunt right on top of my boat, but he had, he had patterned this, these deer. And a lot of times you, you'll drive by and you'll see these deer standing there and they'll just watch you drive by there. There's been dozens of people seen them. You're standing here on the ridge, and you drive right by them. They just look at you. And again, but but I, I, well, I'll say, funny you bring all that up. So the area that I hunted last year, I had a, a, a buddy of mine that I know pretty well. And one reason I found out about this place, or I was getting interested in this place, is, you know, he likes to duck hunt it. Uh, and this is a guy I used to go to school with. And, uh, you know, he traveled, you know, pretty good ways to go and hunt this piece of public. And he was talking about. I, I was telling him like, "What do you, you know? Have you been down there? Do you deer hunt?" He's like, "No, nah, I never deer hunt it." But he's like, "We always go down there and duck hunt." And he's like, "Funny enough, you bring up deer hunting." He's like, "We've been out there in one of those sloughs one day, one morning, way before daylight. We're throwing out decoys, and all of a sudden we hear this thing walking through the water on the edge of the slough. We throw our headlamps over there, and he said it was a giant buck. Just a, you know, he's like, I don't know how many inches. It was a huge deer. Got within fifty yards of them, walking out the edge of the slough. Kind of looked at them." Didn't give a care in the world and just kept on walking. Yep. And I'm like, you never thought about deer hunting? He's like, nah. He's like, by that time of the year, I don't care about deer hunting. <laughs> 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 yeah, kind of yep. like what you mentioned. Um, which is funny enough. And like you said, like it seemed like in that situation, like they almost get conditioned to like people potentially in some of these locations, and also the boat pressure and just all that kind of working together. Like if they have, you know, enough run-ins with people where nothing happens to them and, you know, they don't get shot yeah. at, they don't get spooked off, they just kind of watch them like, oh, it's whatever. It's almost like they condition a little bit to like, okay, I can still yeah. linger in this area. It's almost like you just got to kind of get past that that uh, negative aspect. Like, oh, man, some guys pull up with a, you know, a boat and yeah. dog. They, they and just yeah. kind of keep an eye on you, you know, but they're not like blowing out. Yeah, of Hey, yeah, and hey, it it it, it, it kind of gets you to thinking. That's exactly how the urban hunts are. I mean, the urban hunts you got cars going by and people honking their horns, dogs barking, the deer don't pay no attention to that. You know, it's same 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 thing. It just you know it may take them a little longer to get used to it in some areas, you know, other than others. But I think it's just a matter of getting them getting acclimated to it, and it shouldn't take too long, especially on an older deer. He's done seen it two or three years already, and he knows the gig. And I think the older deer, I, you know, the younger ones may be a little more jumpy for a couple of weeks, but I think those older deer, they already know what's going on. Yeah, that, that's super fascinating. Now, also in the river bottoms, well, I kind of, I kind of led with this in the beginning of the podcast, but I want to kind of get into it is the idea of overlooked spots, and we've kind of mentioned this a little bit with the boat and how that plays a factor, but. Can you give us some examples of, you know, overlooked spots, like the, the differences between an overlooked spot that maybe a mile and a half in that maybe just takes a lot of work to get there versus spots that are maybe a couple hundred yards from access points in the road but has some thick cover kind of, you know, in between you and where you're trying to get. Can you give me some, some like, scenarios or situations of different overlooked spots that you've had success with in finding areas? And then I want to kind of get over to a little bit more into the buck sign. Yes, there we go. 
Yeah. So, so a couple of examples, you know, we, you know, we talked about the overlook spots that's right, right under our noses, you know, and, and it, and it pretty much relates to cover. Um, and, and I think, I think it, I think to really, so finding those other areas, you know, some of the ones harder to get to, I think that's when you got to get out there and you got to actually, you know, run your boat as far as you can and then just take off walking and learn the terrain and find, and find those thickets and those bedding areas. And, and then when season comes, do that same thing and go out there and you, and, and a lot of times what, how I have found places that are maybe not overlooked, but, but just, just don't have no, hunting pressure yet and it's places that i have scouted during the season and go out there and 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 just jump herds of deer you know big herds of deer so these so these deer when when this pressure starts happening in these in these wet areas and these water covered areas they're going to kind of uh, gang up and they'll be there usually there's never one deer it's usually you know half a dozen or so and so a lot of times what i'll do I'll just get out and start walking. And sometimes I'll jump these deer in these areas and I'll go look at that area and I don't know why they're over there. You know, you'll see beds, sometimes, like I was saying, sometimes wide open. Uh, just, I think it really relates to places they just haven't been disturbed. And and I think that's, you know, that's, you know, and, and it could be, you know, you. I've also seen them where there's a slight elevation way back you know maybe just a barely slight elevation there may be that slight elevation there may be different uh, type of oak trees there may be a little grove of white oaks down through a spot and sometimes that's that's what you want to key in you know maybe it's a different food source way out there or or sometimes right under your nose you know right you drive right by i think a lot of times um so another another key thing about that corner there was white oaks up in that corner and there's no white oaks on the whole place only in that corner. So that, that could be another reason. So sometimes it's the food, you know, it's, it's pressure along with a good food source that they like and no, no human activity and bingo, there you go. And, and sometimes you can't see that. They're just there. Uh, another thing I've got to just, ask you about actually i've got two things and then i'm going to turn it over to andrew because he's got a lot of questions specifically on the buck sign but on i was trying to see which one i want to ask first so when it comes to like overlook spots and buck activity okay how do the deer change from say early season like both seasons like say like you know late september when season opens through october when there's still pretty good leaf cover Verse, you know, later November, again, December, when leaves are completely off the trees, everything's dead. How much do the deer shift between where they bed and spend a lot of time early season in those river bottoms versus where they like to shift to, again, taking water into consideration later into the season when, you know, there's complete leaf off situation? Because I can imagine, even in some of these wide open areas, it still seems kind of thick, especially green briar and different things mm-hmm. growing early season and then later season being a lot more bare in some of those locations. Yeah. So, uh, so as far as buck sign goes, um, s- some of these areas, I'm going to tell you this, some of these areas, and I don't know if it's this way where you guys hunt. Some of these areas that I find these, you know, I may go scout some of these in Southeast Arkansas, I may go scout some of these areas. I'm, I, I've, had people go with me, uh, tag along with me and show them new areas. And I've had people say, I'm not coming back down here. There's not enough buck sign. And it may be mid October. So what, what sign that I find, what buck sign that I find in, in those areas. So, so Arkansas is really different than, I don't know how much different it is in Alabama, but we have a huge swing of rut huge it's 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 a month probably maybe more so it's probably probably a good a good bit more than a month i mean we we have some of our deer are, are rutting down there where i hunt in mid-december uh 
where Sonny's at, it's mid-October. So, I mean, it's a huge swing. But what I have found is that sign, September, I don't even go look down there in September. Uh, it just, I just don't go. I'll wait till October, and that sign sometimes is very subtle. You know, we talked about the little bitty tiny bush that got twisted around a little bit. You know, those type of rubs. 480, that was the episode, right? Mm -hmm. Back in 480, we talked about that. So those little bitty subtle rubs, I don't look for big signpost rubs at early season. I just want to know where the buck is hanging out. Don't matter what, really, it don't matter what size he is. Okay, because usually if there's one buck, there's going to be a couple more with him. So I kind of just look for any buck sign, and it's always down there. It's always really, really subtle. You know, it might be that little twisted up pinky size, half the size of your pinky. And I'll find that, and I have found that later on in the year, that's where some of them same areas, but it always, 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 it ends up being a place that is thicker than the rest. You know, does, does that make sense? It's always thicker because we're talking about big, wide open woods, most for the most part. And it's always going to be thicker in that area where you're going to find the, the late season buck sign. It's always usually going to be thick. So that's kind of what I key in on is I, is I, I stay in the thickets. You know, sometimes it's not thickets. Sometimes it's just a slight thicket that's just a little different than open woods. But that's where that sign is going to be every time. It's going to be, and usually it'll be in the same vicinity. And it's, you know, it's not going to be half a mile from where you found it the first time. Unless it's a different deer, you know, I mean, you could run into that. But most of the time, it's going to be pretty close to where that early season, real subtle, uh, little bitty rubs and stuff. It's going to be close to where they're at. Yeah, and see, I wonder how much of that I missed last year when I was hunting in October on this place uh, in Arkansas because I really didn't see much sign at all, especially I was looking for scrapes and everything. I was like, man, maybe I'm early uh, hunting mid-October and uh came back in november and it like completely changed like completely changed and like you said like all that sign was in that thicker stuff yeah. and, and big sign big rubs scrapes everything yeah um one thing i wanted to run by you and then i was gonna we're gonna dive really deep on the sign aspect that and again andrew's really interested in oh, yeah. and i'm interested in as well but is i had a situation last year i want to run by you so on this piece of public i had hiked way i actually took the boat in and then hiked way back into the spot um, and I got into a slough, like a really a slough you couldn't get a boat in. Just put it that way, okay? Um, yeah. There's there's no way to get a boat in um, unless you're going to be ramping some giant beaver dams. Just I mean monsters. And <laughs> yeah. some, some of you Arkansas boys might would do that for some ducks. I don't know if anybody's doing that for a deer. Um, but when I got back in there, I found it was three or four giant overcups. Okay, Ac uh, acorn acorns. I almost said acorns. So yeah. you want to say it? Pure pressure, dude. You just, you just need to give in and no, just say it. It's pure pressure. <laughs> uh, but anyways, acorn, acorn. Yeah, <laughs> sound like a northern. There were some acorns over yeah. there. Andrew used to say it. Just I'm, I'm springing back up until he heard Clay Newcomb say it. He didn't. He didn't say acorn. No, so. I did. I said them interchangeably, and then I made a conscious decision to just go with acorn. <laughs> uh, but anyways, so. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was this little spot next to the slough, and it's really wide open. There was a little, there's a slight, there was a couple wide oaks there where there's all these huge overcups right up against the slough. Had that buck brush you talked about that went way out into the water. Um, yeah. And where these these big overcups uh, were at, it was almost like a, a slight peninsula that went out into the slough. And this is a really big slough, really long slough. Mm -hmm. And it was, I mean, bare ground. They were eating. They were hammering the these overcups, and there was some bigger tracks there, a bunch of doe tracks, everything in between. They didn't really find any buck sign right there, but there's some buck sign a little bit higher up in elevation, uh, just off the slough. But wide open. There was no way to get in these trees. These trees were ginormous. Like it, it would take a ten foot strap for climbing sticks in order to get around <laughs> these trees, dude. I mean, they were huge, and it was bare ground, and it was nothing between these overcups and the water. And then if you kept following this little peninsula as it went out into the slough, it kind of went out and made a bend. And when it made a bend, it got a little bit thicker. And then there was a little grove of persimmons, small persimmons. Persimmons about the size of my forearm, okay? They were loaded, mm -hmm. they were dropping, and there was feed sign all around them. And it got real skinny on that peninsula. It was probably only 30 yards wide. 
right up against the water, and you can see the deer are coming through the water. You can see all the tracks coming through the water across the slough to get on these persimmons before they went to the overcups. Directly across, I didn't hunt this spot, okay? I found this in October. Directly across from this little peninsula, it kind of petered out right there into the buck brush in the water, and it got real deep on one side of the slough that yeah. the deer were coming across. Directly across, not 75 yards, was another peninsula that came out from the north down into this slough, very long peninsula, probably about 200, 300 yards long. It probably was no wider than 75 yards at the very most. But looking at the map and looking across at it, it was extremely thick. Tons of understory. You could tell there's different oak species over that were growing. And clearly some of the deer were coming from that direction. When looking at this spot, I still could not figure out hunting because I'm like, if I go on that peninsula, I'm blowing out every deer on the peninsula. I, I couldn't figure out a way yeah, to be able to get yeah. in there cl clean. How would you go about analyzing a situation like that, especially if I would have found, say I would have found some really big rubs or a big scrape where I could tell there's a buck coming across that slough from that really thick peninsula? That So it really sounds like a tough setup to start with. Uh, but, you know, you, you're you on to a good, uh, I think you're on to a good thing by checking out that other side. But, and, and I'm not sure by the way you described it, but I would almost, I would almost maybe think about a kayak or, or waders or something and stay in the water. If you can see down, you know, a little ways down and kind of, you know, come in, come in, in the water, you know, I, I mean, because like you said, it sounds like there's no way to get to it without blowing the deer out. So I, I don't know without actually seeing it on a map, I would I would definitely think of something crazy probably, and I and knowing me I would go and I would do the hardest possible thing there would be to, to, to make it work. That's usually how it happens. But I would definitely think about coming in using the water, you know, like we talked about in the beginning, using the water for your advantage and slipping in that way. Maybe you know maybe kind of splitting the difference, and 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 just you'd have to use the wind, of course. And, and, you know, maybe come in from the south. I'm trying to trying to picture it when you yep. when you called it out. Kind of coming, maybe come in from the south and find you a, you know, find you something to. You know, uh, I don't know if there'd be a tree there. Or even I mean, I've had to lower my boat down in the water before. You know, hunting in the water. I mean, it's. Uh, but I mean, maybe try coming in. That that's be the only thing I would know is to try coming in from the water, uh, catching the wind right. Either come in from the north. If, if that water goes on up to the north, if it's if you got a good south wind or vice versa, but I would try to use that water to my advantage. I think in that situation. So, kind of going back and, and thinking about it, if I could have gotten onto that thick peninsula, I think there's a very good chance to kill a buck on that spot. Um, the thing I was wondering about, because I, I probably could have drug a kayak back into that area, um, you know, yeah. off the main body of water I came in from. Um, but looking over at it, it just, it looked, it was one of those peninsulas and maybe you've seen this before. You got some real big timber, but it's kind of sparse timber. Like there's definitely trees you can get in on that side, but the understory was so thick. I mean, you just looked over there and it was like that buck brush, um, all kinds of briars and honeysuckle, just nasty. But yeah. You could tell when I walked down the peninsula where it, the, the one I, that had the, that had the uh, over cups on and the, the persimmons, when it stopped yeah. in the water, yeah, I could look at the tracks and it went directly over to that big peninsula, like directly over to yeah. like that thicket where that those deer were coming from. And I did get, I never hunted. It was during bow season. Um, uh, and looking back at it, I'm like, dude, maybe I should try to get creative and get in there because I feel like if I would have timed that spot, especially with some kind of front coming through, I think you could have had a really good opportunity oh, yeah. at get, catching a buck in there, whether you catch them on the persimmons, but the, there was no way to hunt that spot because trees are too small. You'd have to sit on the ground. It was, I mean, literally the deer had the ground barren. It was mud from what they were, they were just tearing up. The coons were in there just tearing everything yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I still think back about, man, if I could have got over to that peninsula, maybe could have made something. Yeah. Happen. You need to, yeah. You need to go back there, maybe kayak or waders or, and you need to ghillie suit that maybe. I mean, I don't know. Get in there and just lean. You know, I mean, just make it happen. Just do something crazy. What what, what I thought, what I seriously thought about doing is like, dude, if I had one of those uh, marsh stools the guys duck hunt out of where I could get out in like two feet of water and sit down and be like, 
you know, have water kind of up on my thighs and kind of like hunt yeah. the edge of that slough. Maybe could have made something happen, but dude, that buck brush is something else. Like how thick it is. Uh, but the deer, I mean, they're going right through it, man. They were going right yeah. through it. There was good, there was good tracks. I mean, definitely there's a mature buck in the area. Um, yeah. And now looking back at it, I didn't put any trail cameras out in October. Yeah, I should have put a trail because this place I can put trail cameras out at. I should have put a trail camera on that little peninsula yeah. up kind of high because again, it, it definitely floods yeah. in there, uh, just to see what was coming into that spot. But uh, yeah. yeah, hindsight's always twenty twenty. But hey, we got yeah, we, right. we, we got this season, so who knows? Yeah, that's right. Hey, you got you got the redemption season. season. Yeah, that's right. Yep. All right, I we got to get into buck sign. I've been. Real excited to talk about buck sign, and we keep referencing back to it, and, and it kind of seems like the crux of a lot of what your tactics are. It it ends up kind of pointing back to that buck sign, and, and we talked a little bit about rubs and, and stuff, but I really want to talk about scrapes and tracks specifically, and I want to I want to start with scrapes. Uh, can you just give like a general overview, kind of on your thoughts of scrapes and and what they mean to you and how you might use them? So. Yes, and so my my thing is, um, and I'm not, I'm really not. I I wind up hunting scrapes. I'm really not a so-called. I, I don't I don't get fired up. I mean, I do get fired up when I see scrapes. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not going to go necessarily set up on just scrapes because I have seen scrapes on logging roads. Uh, you know, they'll they'll do a lot of that at night. And so I, I, I typically don't get too fired up on them, but when, when I find a place that has just like dozens of scrapes in a, in a bottom, in a feeding area, in a feeding situation, um, that that's when I'll get kind of get really serious about hunting scrapes. And, you know, and it'll be, it'll be the scrapes, the bigger scrapes. And I always look at the tracks in the scrapes. Um, uh, to, to you know to, to to see especially where these places i can't have cameras but i'll always look for those big old huge these type of troll i call them type of track where you know it's he's he's a big enough deer that his he, he tracks almost look like a hog track you know they're more rounded uh wide big wide tracks i look for that you know knowing their buck tracks and big body deer uh but a lot of these scrapes in these feeding areas, they're going to have rubs by. Um, and I, w- I will always go, and like we talked about, I will always go study. I'll go study those rubs. Down, I mean, I'll get down there on my hands and knees and look at them, you know, and, and, and feel of the, of the stuff to see how old I think it might have been or whatever. But sc- the scrapes, when it's in what Sonny called – hot spot that's that's when i that's when i hunt scrapes. if it's if it's on a trail or a travel corridor i don't really get too fired up about that if there's now if, it, if there's a, a strip of if there's a ridge or, or or a high spot that has four or five big pin oaks and they're really hitting them hard and there's scrapes there if i got more than one thing going on for that scrape area i'll hunt it and I'll drop a pin, and I'll remember that, and I'll go back to that, and I'll count it. I'll count on that as a, as a place I can go back to. But if it's if it's just occasional scrape every twenty or thirty yards, or every fifty to hundred yards on travel corridors, I usually don't get too fired up. And the reason I think, my opinion, the reason I don't is because those really really hot spots, a lot of times a, a dominant or mature buck. He won't let those little deer make too many scrapes around his, you know, he's going to kind of keep them run to the edges. And what I have found is some of these travel corridors that's going from these little hot spots, core areas, not necessarily a core bedding area now, but maybe a core feeding area where there are all these deer activities at, you'll find scrapes that's, that's strung between from one of those to the other. And I think a lot of them are yearling bucks. They're doing their little deal, what daddy done, they can't do it over here because he won't let them so i don't pay as much attention all scrapes is not are not uh of course if you're running cell cam you know you know if you're running cameras you can kind of see what's going on better but in these areas where i can't run cameras i don't i pretty much it's got to have several things going on 
mm-hmm. for me to for me to camp out on, you know. So that relates back to something that we we discovered for ourselves kind of in hill country last year where we're hunting more mountainous terrain or more hilly terrain and like I've been I've been fascinated with scrapes for years and and they've always been something I've gravitated to and tried to learn more about. And what what I've learned both from talking to a lot of different guests on this podcast but also now in my mm-hmm. own experience is that when I kill a buck over a scrape, which I killed two bucks, not necessarily in a scrape, but in the vicinity of what I would call a community scrape last year, it's mm-hmm. not necessarily that the scrape is attracting them to that spot. It's that the scrape is in a spot that they already want to be. And that scrape right. is just kind yeah. of like a yeah. focal point, you know, that I'll hunt yeah. close to because they're probably going to swing like 80 yards within that scrape. And so that kind of sounds like what you're saying here in Flatland too. Like if you're in the right spot to begin with, you're going to find those really nice scrapes and, and it's going to be a good area. But that scrape is not necessarily like what is drawing the deer to the area. They're already there and that's why that scrape is there too. Is, is that right? Right. Yeah, and, that, and that's exactly right. That's kind of what I meant by it's got to be more than – there's got to be several other things going on in that spot. You know, for, and, you know, and, and that's where you find those big community scrapes, and community signpost rubs, and what have you. But there's got to be, there's got to be, it's got to be the spot, like you're saying. Yeah, it's got to be, you know, probably a good traffic area for does and 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 a lot of food and cover. It's got to have it all. And I think, I think that's, yeah, I think that's what you're, what you're, mm-hmm. you know, what you're referring to too. So let's just let's let's say that it's a it's like a late october maybe early november hunt or something where you're at it's starting to get good maybe it's not like prime rut yet but it's starting to get to that time of year where you're hitting your stride and you're getting excited what what do you need to see when you go into the woods let's say you're going to check one of these bedding areas that we talked about earlier what and and you're going in there to spot check it or you're scouting or whatever what do you need to see in that spot to say okay i'm gonna i'm gonna sit here i think i can kill a buck right here yeah so so i'm gonna try to pin pin down your timing so here's an example i have i'm gonna put in for a muzzleloader permit hunt in southeast arkansas on this particular wma and that's gonna be in that's gonna be in around the 20th of october so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna go down there and i'm not gonna look for buck sign not at all what i'm gonna look for is pinch points going to going strictly from feeding to bedding areas that's what i'm that's what i'm gonna look for and and that that's you and you'll you'll find buck sign there but it's kind of a bonus if you do but what i like to do down there is is for this particular area what i'll what i'll usually do is i'll find where they're going around the end of a slough uh and i'll check it you know i'll check it for sign and Tra- you know tracks um and we can use cameras down there in this place but i probably won't put but a couple out but i'm going to check these i'm going to check these what i call funnels or pinch points that so for mid-october and i know that's kind of that's kind of a, you know you're going to talk about scrapes but for mid-october they don't put down too many scrapes yet their scrapes usually come and, and like I said, that kind of goes back to a timing thing. They don't usually come till, you know, the 1st of November to the 15th of November, somewhere around there. That's when they'll start putting that, those scrapes and stuff down. And now if I'm going to go back down there then, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start looking for the freshest rubs that I can find. And they'll have, they'll have scrapes by then. Not a lot. This, this particular area, they don't do a lot of scraping. And, I mean, you got to think about it. That's that's one reason that one guy that, that I took down there, he didn't want to go back. He said there wasn't enough deer sign there. But he said there was enough, nowhere near enough buck sign for him to hunt. In some of these areas, they don't, they just don't. It's so open. I really believe they rely on sight and smell more than they do these scrapes. And I don't think they put as much, they don't do as much scraping down there as they, they'll do rubs, but you just don't see as many scrapes down there in, in this certain area. So I key in. I'll key in on tracks. I'll t- tracks trump everything for me. Tracks and and droppings. Let, That's let, pretty much what my rule of thumb is. Let, let's talk about tracks. I'm excited to talk about tracks. So 
uh, I mean, just what what attracts mean to you, and and what are you looking for when you say like you're, you're that's like the ultimate thing? Like, what exactly are you looking for there? So, so this particular, like I said, I'm always thinking of a certain spot when you ask the question. So, so this particular area, it's either mud or sand. I mean, if it's really dry, if it's really dry, it might just be dirt and a hard path. But it'll either be it'll either be sand. There's lots of sand, and it's on the given a little bit away. It's on the it's close to it's close to the big river, so it's close to the Arkansas River. So when it floods, it's going to dump some sand in, and it usually floods every year. So what what I always look for, and when I say tracks. You know, in this mud and sand, like if they're going to go around the end of this slough, it's either going to be mud or sand, and they're going to bury up. They're going to bury up to their, you know, up here past their hooves. And man, you can tell, you can tell right away by the by the diameter of that. I've seen deer that had their legs as big around as my arm, you know, just my wrist, you know. And you know, you know when you when you have that, you know it's a it's a good deer, you know, by all means over 200 pounds and there's a lot of deer down there that that body size so that's kind of when i'm just keying in on tracks that's what i look for if that's what i'm going after i look for that big that big leg that went way down in the mud or uh if it's hard pack i look for that rounded you know that rounded instead of a sharp track like that the more rounded it is the bigger around that leg is that's just kind of my rule of thumb okay yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> oh yeah. Do you ever look for tracks uh, coming and going, like maybe in the, some of these pinch points that you're running through and checking? Are you looking for tracks going multiple directions, or are you just looking for tracks in, or a big track in general? So, so normally, so normally early season, I'll give you a scenario. Normally early season, so I I went down to this same area and I found this I found the place where there's a slough and uh, an oxbow comes in and shallows up and it's just a little muddy place where some small cypress trees are and it drops off back down into a slough and runs on through the woods so I went there and I and what I look for right there there's a huge bedding area behind it okay so almost all the tracks coming out of that bedding area so what they'll do is in this particular area, they'll come out here and they feed on muscadines, uh, nut alls. I mean, there's a bunch of nut alls. I don't know if y'all have nut alls down there, but they the deer love them. But and it, nut a nut all is is now that's what these biologists call them. It's a big what I call a northern red oak. It's that real sleek bark red oak, and it has real pretty big. Like, so anyway, they're they're feeding on them. But what they'll do is they come across that mud. And always the tracks are always going one way. So they'll come out there and they'll feed throughout the woods and spend the night out there and, and they'll always go back a different way. Uh, they don't always turn around and come right back. They, uh, most of those tracks you see are coming out, go, you know, going, go, going, coming out of the bedding. And, and so I set up on that one year. We, me and a friend of mine went down there and we scouted strictly by tracks. And we found two spots uh, that we seen buck tracks. We knew there were buck tracks. No cameras involved. We we just went down there and looked for tracks. I, he found you know he found a ditch that this deer was crossing, and it was really really cool. So it was red clay mud in this ditch where it had washed through, and it was on the bank of a lake, an oxbow, big big oxbow. Will is kind of a will oxbow. So. This bank of this lake is kind of a little, kind of a bluff, and it was thick bedding area all down the side of it, half half to three quarters of a mile of bedding area. All right, and we found a place where there's a, a drainage going into this lake, and dude, we found a place where there was tracks that looked like they were two months old, then tracks that looked like they were a month old, and it was like this deer's going through here every day. I mean, I could even almost tell you what time of day it was. No, I'm just kidding. But he was going through there every day, coming off that bank, off that bedding area, going into these open woods. And I told my buddy, I said, this deer is coming, crossing this ditch and going right along the side of this little finger and crossing this, crossing this little 
little right away down here. And he set up the very first afternoon and killed that deer. He wasn't there 45 minutes to kill that deer. It was a nice nine point, about 180 pound deer. Uh, and same thing where I was at. We both set up in two different spots, strictly from tracks. And both of us tagged, tagged the buck. Both of us on the same weekend. And uh, that, that was pretty cool. But th- that one situation where he was at, it was it was almost a daily routine. You could see that deer's tracks going across one direction every time. And it looked like a day older than the next, and, you know, I mean, all the way back to where they was ranked completely out. But it was pretty cool seeing that. I actually wish I would have got some video or pictures of it, but that deer was coming through there. You know, it was early season. This is, we're talking before October, you know, late September. And that deer was in a routine, you know, like they always are. And he was in a routine every day by himself, you know, and, and he killed him, got him the first time he sat there. But that's 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 how important tracks are. If you can get in a place and it's undisturbed and nobody else is bothering them, tracks can pay off big. That that that's awesome, man. That's exactly what I was wondering about is when you go out and you find a, a set of big tracks, you know, is that enough? And it sounds like in that spot it it was the consistency seemed to yeah. kind of pique your interest, but what about later in the season? Does that same thing kind of hold true? You're still looking for that consistency where it seems like there's a lot of deer coming through, or do you just need a big set of tracks and say, okay, he's here in the area. Let's say it's it, real fresh. You yeah. know, and you're like, okay, he's here. Now let's, let's set up and hunt. Well, it, it really, when it gets to the mid season, I don't, I don't emphasize as much on the tracks of what I, well, I mean, you want to, yeah, I emphasize on tracks, but as long as there's a good amount of tracks, but when it gets later in the season, you, you got to find, you got to find the trail. You got to think like these deer are, are ganged up. These deer are, they're six or eight deer. That wherever, you know, wherever that big buck is at, if you think back, he it's later in the season. He's been having some pressure. He's around. He's got a little hair of my does usually down there in this particular area. I'm thinking of just like when I walked up on that dead tree there, there was a whole herd of deer, and I didn't tell you, but one of them was 150-inch acre. I mean, he ran right out there and stopped with me with a crossbow. or I had my compound, and he stopped about 100 yards and just turned around and watched. But So what I'm looking for later in the season is an unbelievable amount of tracks. Like, like you think you're going to just stop them in and you're going to see a deer. I mean, that many. So that's what I look for late in the season is just a super, super amount of tracks, like just un- almost unbelievable. And that's that's a little harder to find, but when you find it, it'll pay off, just like that one set of tracks will pay off. And how might that relate with feed sign just throughout the season? Uh like like feed sign under like the nut all oaks or or maybe a persimmon or just whatever you happen to be hunting. Yeah, so and, and going back to persimmons and usually that's going to be early season here. I don't know about where you guys are, but by mid October the persimmons are long gone here. So early season they got tons of tracks around them, and I have spent many hours under persimmon tree, and I have never killed a trophy deer trophy buck under symmetry. I know a lot of people have. Uh, I can tell you stories that, that I've heard, but so what What I mean, as far as food and tracks later in the season, I, I think I think it's going to go right back to the thicket, the, the, little, the little thickets. And I'll tell you something that we haven't talked about. That they really key in on down there in this southeast Arkansas, and that is uh, – Honey locusts. Use, and usually where you find honey locusts, you're not going to find a bunch of tracks if it, unless it's really muddy and we've got a lot of rain because that's usually they're usually on a little hill or a, or a high spot. But later later in the year, when, when I'm telling you about these massive amount of tracks, it's usually from several things. It's usually not food. It's usually from from hunting pressure. They're gonna they're gonna push them back to a certain area, and they're gonna create some travel corridors that that they hadn't been you know. And that I think that's I think that's uh, what a lot of that is doing. 
some of it, some of it may be some, around some of these food sources, but I've related that to more, more to pressure than anything else. Okay. At least where we are. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, the feed tree thing is always interesting too, especially in Arkansas. I feel like a lot of guys that we talk to from Arkansas are, are big on the feed trees. And I was going to ask you about oh, yeah. honey locusts because we we just interviewed uh, Jonathan Moreland a couple weeks ago, and and he you know he hunts in your general area, and he's man he's big on the honey locust, and and he says oh, yeah. kind of the I same thing. It. Like that's that's one of his favorites is is going to be that honey yeah. locust. And yeah. is it something that you feel like people overlook in your area? I think some of your hardcore guys fully aware of it the guys that hunt late season they know the deal with the honey locusts yes by all means some of the folks that don't that maybe tag out or hunting pine tickets up here uh, like i said we got every kind of terrain you can imagine there's a, probably 75 percent of the people that hunt that don't even hunt around the honey locusts so i would say they could be some people could be overlooking them but these guys these guys that are deer hunting while everybody else is duck hunting, they know what honey locust is, and they're not overlooked. I okay. promise you that. So, so one of my last questions, specifically on tracks, is uh, as it relates to feed trees as well. Like when you go find a feed tree and there's a lot of feed sign underneath it, do you need to find like let's say you're you're really trying to kill a buck, do you need to find that that big impressive track underneath that feed tree? Or if you find, let's say you find a feed tree and it's got a lot of tracks, a lot of sign underneath it, but you just can't find that really big track. Are you going to move on and try to find a different feed tree that has that big track under it because you're trying to find that bigger, bigger buck? So that kind of gets back to my scouting. So what I would, what I would normally do, and this is just me, this is just, you know, and I, and I think that's, I think that gives everybody their creative hunting style, your personal style of hunting, and, and everybody looks at things differently. But what I would do is I would walk my boots off, and I would make sure that there's not another feed tree close by that. And if it is, I'd find it. And then I'd compare them, and I'd kind of look and, count, you know, maybe, and I'd maybe compare, if there's two, if you found two or three of them, Compare, kind of compare them, even go back on your Onyx and look at some of the, you know, and, and I would probably go with the one closest to a, a bigger thicket or closer to some bedding area or closer to a swamp. I would probably stick with that one. If, if there wasn't some absolutely huge tracks in one and not in the other, if it's pretty similar, I'm going to go with the one closest to the bedding area or closest to the thicket or maybe the hardest one to get to. Like I said, I always do stuff the hard way, but that would be my approach to that. I would, I would go, I would go make sure there ain't another one nowhere around. And if it ain't, I'd camp out there and try it out. I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of part of it is just hunting. You know, you ain't going to score every time. You're not going, you're not going to get it right every time, but it's fun to, to sit by that, that feed tree and see what shows up, you know, and, but I would, you're already scouting. You're looking. You're already there. You might as well go to the other. You know, you know, go go check some other areas and make sure there ain't another one close by. That's what I would do, and and eliminate. If there ain't another one nowhere around. That's that's where he's gonna come to. That's that's what that's my opinion anyway. That's my that would be my strategy. About that. Michael, Man, it's gonna be fired up. Yeah, Michael, I've got to ask you something real quick because I, I just I just now realized this. Is <clears> the deer <throat> off your right shoulder? Is he a double drop ton buck? Yes. What's the story? Yes, What's the I'd story? love to tell you. That's a long story. I'd love to tell you about that. I sent you a picture too. You can. You can oh man, uh, I didn't, I didn't put that on. But yeah, so uh, I killed that deer in Illinois. I'd love to tell you the story. It's kind of a long story, but have all, have, it was. Have uh, it was so my cousin was in Illinois, and he told me he called me. He was he was up there. Been up there a couple of weeks. And he was telling me about this deer they were seeing, and. Uh, he told me where they were seeing it, and up there you got little block wood blocks and some funnels and some you know Illinois is perfect, tons of funnels. And anyway, I knew about this, you know, I knew about where they where they were seeing the deer, and then about three days before I was ready to go up there, I quit seeing him. Well, in my mind, I kind of thought I bet he's over there, 
one one hilltop over in this deep ravine I, where I killed the other one that's behind the he's kind of got that one hid he's behind anyway I'd, I'd already killed a deer there before and real nasty deep ravine I mean and it fingered out it was like it, it hard to even get in and out of it. and I thought you know I bet that deer went over there and he's holed up in that because nobody was going over bothering the area and so I, I started being kind of cocky and I told my cousin I said you better you got three you got three days to kill him because I'm fixing to be coming Saturday and I and when I get there, things they kill him. You know, I was just, you know, I was just playing with him and uh, just kind of, just kind of messing with him. And I went and I didn't go straight to that spot, uh, but I did end up. I let it, I let it. You know, I kind of thought about it and I let, I let the wind. It was different wind. I let the wind get right. And the second day I was there, I went over two o'clock in the afternoon climbed the tree and killed the deer in 30 minutes. Same one that they had been after him for two weeks. But it was just, it was really funny uh, because I had messed with him the whole time he was up there. I was like, you got, you got him and you need to kill that deer because when I get there, I'm fixing to kill him. Well, my cousin had went home. He wasn't there when I killed the deer. He had done packed up and went home. And we were hunting out. We were on an outfitter place, kind of a free range. You know, he had let us have free range of him. Got there. And uh, so I, I shot this deer with my muzzleloader and walked up to the top of the hill where I could get service. And Jack, my friend, Jack Mester, hey, Jack, if you're watching. When you w-. So uh, I had he was the first call I made. And uh, I called him and told him the drop time was, was mine. The double <laughs> drop time was mine. And he, he you could have heard a pin drop. You could have heard a pin drop when, when I told him that. He, he didn't know what to say. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, that was a funny story, and I just got lucky. I mean, I, I kind of thought that's where the deer would be, and sure enough, that, that's where he was. At. But hey, we'll take luck over skill. I'll take luck over skill anytime. Stuff like that. Yeah, no doubt, no freaking doubt. And if people want to see that deer, they can tune into the video version of this podcast, which is live that's on right. YouTube. Yeah, gotta get the video to see it. Yeah, yeah buddy. Dude, what a freaking deer! That's a big one. Yeah, it's kind. It's I'll kinda... throw that picture out. Yeah, no, for sure. It's kind of funny how, you know, just the finding that thick cover and that really rugged area that nobody really want to push into and your thought process after, you know, knowing the property a little bit and that's kind of what was holding that buck up kind of goes back down to the river bottom stuff is like just trying to find that thickest, nastiest spot that nobody wants to go to. And a lot of times that's where that mature buck's going to hold yeah. up at. Yeah. And if you can get in there clean, yeah. get the right wind, the right setup, you know, you could have an opportunity yeah. at that deer. Yeah. And guys like, and you, you all know this, but I've learned over the years is, is, as much as we can learn about everything, timing is the 100% most important factor of all. I mean, yeah, luck, luck is also, you know, yeah, yeah oh, we always want to have good luck. But timing, man, if you can get the timing right, it's because, uh, cause you know, we're learning and everybody's learning, uh, learning how to, how to, be better hunters but a lot of times we get too impatient and we bust it before it's really the right time i think time is is the best the best thing anybody can take away from any 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 hunting lesson make sure you do it on the right time and that just takes sometimes that takes time to figure out when that is in your particular area you know you guys timing may be different than ours and even and even where sonny's at his time his peak time is the middle of October, towards the end of October, and their root is in wide open, full swing, right about the first of November. The, our youth season's the first weekend in November, and the kids usually hammer giants up there where some of these at. But down, but down where I go is first of December. So timing, dude, timing is is very critical. I would say that'd be my that, like Sunday said that'd be my tip of the day. Well, uh, as a point to kind of wrap up here, uh, Michael, I've got to ask you, you know, from all the listeners who's messaged us about, you know, wanting more river bottom, you know, flatland content episodes, what would be like one of your biggest pieces of advice for them going out this season? If they haven't really had that consistent, uh, consistent success in those areas, 
what to pay attention to, whether it's kind of summarize this episode or any other kind of lasting you know, piece of advice or tips you would give those guys in order for them to figure out and, and pay attention to come this season? So, so actually, I'm glad you pointed that out. I'm about to do a video for our YouTube channel. I'm going to go deep dive into that, how to have a successful season. And I'm about to put that out there here in a couple, probably within a couple of weeks. But so my best advice, and 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 I'm gonna and I'm gonna blow out there uh, about five key things to do. But the best thing I can tell you is 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 and I'm a passionate deer hunter. I the only time I ain't thinking about deer hunting is when I'm asleep or catching a crappie. But you you need to be prepared. And you need to be passionate about it. You need to, you know, I mean, you, you know, you need to have that passion to where you're going to go the extra mile, whether that means sitting on your computer all night long looking at stuff or whether that means walking that extra mile. But, you know, put the time in, but but be passionate about it, but be prepared. And then, and then ha- have confidence and, you know, get your timing right and have confidence. <laughs> have confidence in, in what you're doing. You know, I mean, do your homework, watch these podcasts and, and, and get these tips, get a notebook, start a notebook in July right now, get a notebook, start a notebook and start writing stuff down because you'll think of things that you need to be doing, you know, and, and when, when season comes, these things may slip our mind. So right, I, I keep a notebook and I write stuff down and, you know, that cute gets you prepared, do your homework, be confident, and, and utilize perfect timing. And, uh, you know, I think a person could go into any terrain, give up, give themselves a day or two, or you could e-scout it, you'll get online, get on Google Earth. I mean, don't got to be honest. You don't have to have honest. Go on your thing on Google Earth. And he- here's here's what I'll say. If you got guys out there that's struggling and, and or, or they just want to be more successful, guys, just subscribe to this podcast and listen to every episode from here to season. And if you ain't fired up by then and you ain't passionate, you might as well as go ahead and buy your duck steps. That's what I say. <laughs> I mean, that's that'd be my number one advice is 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 watch these these guys are good. They get they get a lot of good information out and write it down. I mean, you can always go back and rewatch it. Write it down and take you some your personal notes. And when you go out there, you know, and, and hit the woods, when you get back in the truck, write it down what you you know, write down stuff. I mean, times of the year, times of the day, all that stuff. And and when you're done doing all that and all the scouting, when the time comes and the time's right, you'll have the confidence. You need to, you gotta put the time in too, though. I mean, you gotta it's it's a full you gotta be passionate. Awesome, man. Well that's what I that's that's my best advice man well uh, we appreciate that you know the show's only successful because guys like yourself come on here and share your hard-earned knowledge man and and that that really is a big thing and and you guys put out some good content too so i want you to give a good plug to your youtube channel here where can people find your your content so go to arkansas extreme outdoors on youtube we also have a facebook group where people put pictures up if you guys from alabama or wherever whatever state you're listening from watching from go on our youtube group i mean i'm sorry go on our facebook group we do picture contests all the time and giveaway we give away money all the time yeah y'all y'all got pictures y'all got need to put somewhere too but go check us out on all these things but arkansas extreme outdoors on youtube is where our content is we got great content go to go to videos and scroll back through and see some of these places that i'm talking about some of these places with the water we got videos of deer in the water and everything else. And, and I mean, have that notebook there and, and take some notes and, and write some tips down and just keep watching this podcast. 
Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Michael, can't appreciate you enough for joining us on this podcast. Listeners, thank y'all for listening and thank y'all for watching as well. Uh, if you've enjoyed this podcast, make sure you share it with a couple buddies. And also, if you truly enjoy this podcast, maybe you get some really valuable information from this episode. Go leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And specifically on Apple Podcasts, if you leave us a written review, that would be absolutely fantastic. We're trying to uh, read out those uh, written reviews every single week when we get the new ones in. And also, we appreciate all the listeners out there that have been submitting Q&A forms on our website, the Southern Outdoorsman.com. Uh, these Q&As that y'all been submitting have been fantastic. We've been answering those on all the outros uh, for all these episodes, and it's been interesting to kind of get some of y'all's feedback. So I'm sure, Michael, we'll probably get some Q&As maybe from this episode. If we do, we'll have to probably phone you in and get your takes on a couple different things. Uh, but thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Well, Michael, thank you again for joining us. Listeners, thank you for joining us, and we'll catch y'all back here for the next episode from the Southern Outdoorsman. All right. Podcast. Adios from Arkansas.